I'm Stephen Godson. I'm Director of Policy Exchange. And uh, as many of you will know, Policy Exchange has played a very important part in debate on extremism and counterterrorism during the 15 years of its existence. You also know from what's on your seat, we're very proud that uh, this uh, document uh, produced in the last uh, fortnight had a very considerable attention and uh, impact on the debate on online extremism and it won't be the last uh, heard of this or indeed uh, many of our other forthcoming <coughs> interventions in this area. The uh, importance of uh, the event today is underlined by uh, the quantity and quality of the turnout uh, here today. Stalin, of course, always famously said in the matter of arms production, that eventually enough quantity becomes quality, but there really is uh, much uh, individual uh, quality here today, and quality not least uh, on our panel here today, which is uh, a star-studded uh, event in terms of uh, this uh, most important of debates, relevant, of course, to our whole country, and of course, uh, tragically, to uh, this city we're now in, which knows uh, the pain of terrorism uh, all too well. I'd like uh, particularly at the beginning, uh, because these things are always uh, partnerships, and uh, partnerships for this event only made uh, possible through our sponsors at uh, Poole Reed. Warm welcome uh, to Julian, chief executive there, who of course will be uh, one of the panelists. And uh, I'll just go through, <coughs> many of you will of course uh, know, uh, or may, many of you will know our panelists here today. Ben Wallace, uh, security minister, experience also of counterterrorism for his period in the army uh, in uh, Northern Ireland and beyond. Matt Chishti, one of the senior uh, officers of the Metropolitan Police, re recently retired with huge uh, experience in these areas. Um, Lord Carlisle of Berry QC, first uh, independent uh, reviewer of terrorism legislation and still a most important uh, voice in these matters. And Sarah Khan, who's been a critical uh, figure in the debates on counter-extremism over many years. So I'm sure you'd wish to join me in welcoming them. We're going to discuss a very wide range of issues from uh, the returnees uh, from Syria uh, to the uh, rise. Uh, have we given too much emphasis to lone wolves uh, at the expense of uh, more traditional forms of, uh, or perhaps newfangled forms of terrorism, command, uh, command and control of terrorism operations? We're going to uh, talk also about the impact of uh, Brexit upon the broader areas of counter-terrorism policy and collective uh, security efforts and what all of that means. Many other things we're going to throw it over to questions. If I can just ask our speakers to uh, confine themselves uh, to uh, five minutes apiece, I will uh, seek rigorously uh, to enforce that rule. I remember many years ago at a conference uh, trying to... Uh, enforced discipline upon the Turkish generals who uh, launched some of the military coups in those countries. I understood why they had so military coups after that, because uh, <laughs> they were, they were to say the least, you strong horses. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so uh, over to you, Julian. Thank you again, and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to start? Yeah. <clears throat> OK, um, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, I, before we get on to the threat, I think what you're going to hear uh, from the speakers is that the uh, terrorism threat has evolved an awful long way since Paul Re, uh, Paul Re Insurance Company was formed in 1993. At that time, uh, the threat uh, was very much one against the economy. It was transacted through uh, causing damage to property, uh, and the government of the day chose uh, to counter that by a public-private partnership uh, with the insurance industry uh, to provide a guarantee via Paul Re Insurance Company uh, to the insurance industry so that terrorism insurance could continue to be offered because at that time uh, the insurance industry had to withdraw cover because of the damage to property that was being caused. And that would have obviously led to damage to the economy if buildings were no longer constructed or banks were no longer lending. In um, the 24 or so years that Paul Rees now been in existence, uh, the threat, of course, has changed markedly. Um, and really what I just wanted to highlight was two or three things uh, as to how that has occurred. Um, the obvious one, you just talked about the report, uh, is uh, the advent of cyber and how that may impact the world of terrorism in the future. Um, our coverage, of course, 24 years ago would not have envisaged uh, cyber. Uh, the major change to the Paul Rees cover was to uh, include non, uh, sorry, nuclear, chemical, biological, and radiological in 2002, uh, but cyber was specifically excluded, and I'm particularly pleased 
the property damage that emanates from cyber interference is something that the government has now asked us uh, to include in our coverage from next year. But no sooner had we done that than other gaps in the coverage have begun to appear. You'll have seen um, uh, what happened at uh, Borough Market. Uh, a lot of small businesses now struggling because they were unable to trade for um, a matter of uh, 11 days. Well, if you're a small business and your stock is going off uh, and you're unable to trade, that is pretty catastrophic. But because the 1993 legislation referred specifically to property damage, what was uh, effectively a result of no property damage, business interruption due to a cordon being thrown around an area, um, that those businesses were unable to be covered. And so another gap uh, has appeared. But I'm just going to highlight two or three other gaps. One is awareness, uh, awareness of the insurance market to understand terrorism so that it can return to a normalized insurance market. But more importantly for the consumer, if you're a small business, um, the chances are you're not aware of the risk, you're not aware of the dangers, uh, and you're probably not even aware that you're not insured and that you have to purchase a specific insurance product for that. There's thus a penetration gap, which means that if you're outside of London or if you're a small business, our estimation is that probably less than 2% of that community actually purchase terrorism insurance. And that gives rise to potentially a moral hazard where the government is called upon uh, to pay for losses that could otherwise have been transferred to the insurance industry. Um, there's also coverage gap that I've just referred to, that non-damage business interruption, and that's a gap that we're now working with the government to seek to close. But there's also the issue of price and interdependence. If you are a small business, you may not perceive that you have a threat, but if you happen to be located next to a crowded place, a train station, uh, Manchester Arena is a very good example. You may have seen uh, various small businesses saying that they've seen a noticeable drop-off in business, then you have an interdependence risk, and we need to price the risk accordingly. And lastly, risk management and making sure that we can change consumer behavior by giving price discounts uh, for people that implement government accredited security measures. Um, and all of that will protect people and promote the resilience of the economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Ben Wallace. Um, thank you. Um, well, thanks for asking me today. Um, I'm a Lancashire MP, so it's my sort of one of my home cities. And uh, it was acutely uh, sobering, the attack that obviously happened recently at Manchester uh, Arena, where my own children go to events. And I think it brings home, really, that the threat is very real and live and not just centred around the centre of London that we often see, that um, the threat we currently face, enabled by the internet predominantly, uh, has allowed people to take up jihad, if that's what they want to do, up and down the country. I mean, the current situation with the threat we face is ISIS are obviously, to some extent, in retreat. They are losing ground rapidly in Syria uh, and are moving swiftly down the Euphrates Valley uh, in dwindling numbers. And their response to that is to allow some people to spread out across the world, to send people to other places to find safe spaces, or, or indeed to move from their original uh, tactic, which is directed attacks, to directed moving through to enable, that's effectively people who are already in country, but trying to help them do an attack, to inspired, inspiring people to just effectively come up with an attack uh, themselves. Uh, at the same time, Al-Qaeda have not gone away. Al-Qaeda uh, plays the long game. They are busy consolidating, uh, and uh, they have definitely not left the stage in any way at all uh, and are effectively coming up on the rails. So those are our two main threats at the moment, but alongside that is a growing threat from the extreme right, the uh, neo-Nazi right, who are using the same methods and capabilities that they learn on the internet as ISIS do, and in fact, sometimes we find far-right uh, individuals planning violent uh, attacks have used ISIL manuals or Al-Qaeda magazines to educate themselves, so they're not theologically fussy when it decides how to obviously attack us. But I think what these attacks this year taught us is that this is a long game. This is a long-term challenge we face to our security. That this is not a matter, as I think in the early 2000s, people thought maybe with Al-Qaeda you could cut out the cancer. Uh, they were very, in those days, deliberately planned attacks. If you could just somehow interdict them, <coughs> cut them out of communities, uh, then somehow uh, you know, it would all finish uh, at some stage fairly early. 
The reality is it's not. It's a long-term challenge to our security, uh, and that means we have to re-examine how we fight uh, the terrorists that threaten us uh, today. Uh, what that really means is some of the lessons that I learned, obviously, in Northern Ireland, and we did security services and police in Northern Ireland, was that when you recognize it's a long-term issue, you move up the agenda disruption methods as alongside criminal justice outcome methods, a sort of arrest and conviction. You realize that you simply can't do it all all the time. You can't arrest your way out of everything immediately, and you are dealing with a considerable number of people. The figure that's talked about is 23,000 people. Uh, 3,000 people roughly are currently under investigation in 580-plus investigations, live investigations, and there is another 20,000 people that we are or have been in the past concerned about. And that 20,000 is a real challenge for us, a, because it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a scale that breeds itself. It, it doesn't need to be sent from some cave in Afghanistan or Syria. They can generate themselves and recruit themselves. But also that 20,000 group of people uh, are a challenge to us because of the scale, but also because it may be just a small amount of intelligence that we have on them rather than evidence and we have to learn how we are going to create an environment so that if those people become active, we are ahead of the game and can spot them. And the solution to that, just as we've seen in other parts of the world, is a wider counterterrorism family. That part of building on disruption, it's not just about the police counterterrorism specialists and indeed the security services. It is about making sure that the government's contest strategy is delivered through local government, through the Department of Education and Schools, through health, through the private sector, uh, and through the public at large. We have to, because of the scale of threat we face, involve a much broader and wider family uh, of, uh, against terrorism. And that's why, under this new contest, counterterrorism review, uh, we are looking at a, a, a number of work streams that are much broader than historically we might have looked at. And that's working, a lot of it, with the private sector. It's working with new technologies, but it's also asking police and intelligence services to perhaps some, do something different that they might have done in the past. And it's also me asking my fellow ministers and other departments to make sure that they are fully engaged uh, with it and, and thinking how we can stop this early. The four Ps off the contest, uh, uh, I hope, will remain the same, which is pursue, uh, protect, prepare, and prevent. Pursue is obviously, you know, police... Uh, security services and some other agencies up front and you know going in through the front door arresting the bad guys uh, and getting them convicted uh, and then prevent is the area obviously where we've got to stop the supply of people in that space whether that's the far right or whether that's Islamist extremism we have to stop those people being seduced into violent extremism or groomed as a lot of them are uh, and that is a very important plank of our policy. Thank you very much. Matt Christie. Right. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, I'll try and stick to, to the questions because I've got a lot to say on this, uh, this topic and I've only got five minutes. And it's tempting to go beyond that because of the uh, captive audience that we've got. So, um, firstly, I, I, I'm not an apologist. Uh, neither have I gone native. Uh, as a former police officer, everything about me is about the victim, it's about justice, and it's about doing the right thing. So, I just want to make that clear because. Often when I appear on stages like this, I often get accused of those sort of things, but deliberately to try and undermine either what I'm saying or people like me are trying to say. And that's some of the pushback that we have to give back to try and expose extremism in, in all disguises. And, and the basis upon which I now talk is taking the Prime Minister's words that enough is enough. And it's not partly, it's either it is or it isn't. And we have to take that literally. So what is the, the threat of... Uh, um, uh, people coming back from war-torn areas. A lot, of, a lot of focus is on their capability, hardened, uh, battle-hardened people who are able to then uh, attack within country. I think there is an element of that. Yes, the services can track that, as we do with lots of dangerous people up and down the country, and there's a capacity issue. But I think there's a bigger danger. I think these people nestling back into communities, especially within a context that seems to be evolving, which is often a victim mindset, one which is um, disaggregated from the establishment, almost hostile towards the institutions, 
where there's a sense of grievance that's sewn in. All of those ingredients play into somebody coming back and, and the appeal of somebody having gone away, almost like a folklore hero. Somebody who's put themselves out in the name of their distorted religion, coming back, having done something good. And you can see how attractive that may be to somebody who's disenchanted, disenchanted or disengaged from that mainstream element. And this is why I've always said that, with the exceptional work our specialists do, I actually believe that the war on extremism will be lost or won within neighbourhoods because I think that's where it's got to. Local people coming together, building consensus, but also having the courage to speak out and call out against those that undermine our values. Um, I also think that um, with uh, homegrown terrorists, terrorists, is that a threat that we're over embellishing? I don't think it is. I've always dealt with threat uh, when I was a, a police officer, thinking that you need three ingredients for any threat to become a risk, and that you need opportunity, you need capability, you need motive. Well, the opportunities all around us, we've seen arenas, how much more security can we put around those? I was asked a few weeks ago, can we ever make the railway network absolutely secure? No, you can't, because if you did that, you'll make it unusable. So the opportunity is there. The capability is so low, you can use anything off the internet or even grab a knife or a, or a vehicle. You, we've seen that. So we have to take away the motive. We have to take away how people feel and believe and make sure, in that sense, we go upstream. So it's building upon the prevent agenda, but I think we need to markedly increase that, open that up involve different sections, especially communities, create advocates at the heart of communities and understand what's going on. We need to profile what drives extremism from, it, from who's amenable, what propensity there is, and who is vulnerable. And you can't categorize that in terms of somebody as you do with crime. It's much broader than that, but it is possible. Do the police and service, uh, security services have enough resources and powers? Well, the police, as you know, have been through a reform uh, decade. Much of that has been needed, but we also have to recognise the world has changed. Moving on from traditional crimes, the police are also now dealing with cyber, online grooming, radicalisation, um, and there's a great emphasis, I'm pleased to say, on vulnerability, which requires more partnerships. So the police are in an area where they've increased their specialisms, but they're also doing it in a way that they need to work in partnership. That takes their capacity. Doing that alongside traditional crime, your burglary, your robbery, your street crime, that hasn't gone away. Antisocial behavior and graffiti in neighbors hasn't gone away. The public do expect and do deserve a response to that. So when you've got these increasing demands across the whole dimension, I think we do need to have a look at where we are and what capacity there's needed because the world has changed. So I would be pleading for a, a pause on that and having a look at where we can build further capacity for the safety and protection of people. Are the laws enough? I think, by and large, the laws are enough. But moving forward and building upon what the minister said, I think we do need to have a look at big data and the role that's, going to, the role that's playing now and in the future. Through big data, not just the statistical trends, but actually getting into the content, knowing what's been perpetrated where in terms of cyber, the proximity of cyber and physical attack locations to where people are then moving around. And I think if you look at logistically what's happening on the online space and marry that up with technology, we're going to get a better picture of who's talking to who and where the threat's emanating from and where potential vulnerabilities are. That gives us a head start. And I think that's a better place than putting more barriers on more barriers on more barriers. I, for one, do not like to see barriers on any bridges in London, but I respect the fact that they're necessary at the moment. And once they've gone up, they become a permanent feature. And let's try and reverse that if we can. Um, we've seen how infrastructure has been attacked. Two, two minutes, I'm sorry. Uh, how infrastructure has been attacked. Uh, and I'll spend a minute on this, thank you, Dean. Uh, and, and I think we have to change our psychology. If I just do one quick example where we're absolutely well versed in fire drills. We've seen people outside office locks waiting to get back in. I think we also need to plan uh, and be ready for an attack. If that happens, what does run, hide, tell actually mean? If you haven't seen the video, I would absolutely implore you to have a look at the video. It's frightening, but it's very educational. Lastly, on, on, on Brexit, I suppose, 
uh, and what's happening. Uh, I think we're all unclear what that actually means, but what we have to respect is it's a mass landscape across there. Uh, communities as we know them have changed. There's been migration and movement of people through refugees. So we need to understand what communities are where, respect their, their rights, also engage with them. We're slightly protected because of the water around us, but that does not mean that there can be people who are traveling from country to country, continent to continent. And to that end, I think informal relationships across the law enforcement sector do work and can work very, very well. Uh, going forward, just one last thing on uh, government practical steps uh, with the Commission being asked to comment on that. Whatever form the Commission takes, I think that the function needs to be understood first. I see it as an autonomous body, similar to JTAC. This is the extremism. Yeah, position, yeah, uh, which is similar to JTAC, uh, and is able to have the power to speak and to advise on an independent basis, where people are respecting it for the independence and its uh, and its expertise. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Lord Carlisle. Um, thank you, Dean. Um, I want to start by setting out what I regard as five essentials for good counter-terrorism policy. First, it must be informed as to what terrorism is and why it arises. It must be coherent. It must be a policy, not a set of happenings. It must be strategic, because strategic <coughs> policy will carry even some of the doubters. It must be tactical, because it has to be tactical to hit its targets. And it must be operational because often it has to act in operational urgency. The reason why I think that counterterrorism policy just doesn't work unless it has those five attributes is because it's so dangerous. When I became independent reviewer of terrorism legislation, actually on the day of 9-11, I thought we were looking maybe at 10 years of this kind of terrorism. I now believe that my children and my grandchildren may well be looking at this kind of terrorism. So it's a very serious long-term issue. Why are third-generation <laughs> British Muslims becoming involved in violent Islamism? Well, I have an easy answer to that. Read Sarah Khan's recent book because it explains it very clearly indeed. And it's a very, very good read, but it is happening. Um, why is it so dangerous? Because, well, when I got on the train in London this morning, I was quite hungry, so I had quite a bit of breakfast. But if I've got a bomb strapped to my back or I'm driving a van down London Bridge um, at the public, I'm not quite anything at all. There are no gradations, so it creates immense danger, and we have to be able to deal with that. How is it made so dangerous? Well, partly because of the Internet. To my generation, the idea that one could be radicalized looking at a screen in one's bedroom at one time seemed crazy. Believe me, it's happening every hour of every day in every Western country in, uh, that we have. And indeed, that is borne out by the 2016 figures in the European Union of 164 deaths and 899 injuries. And this year, to date, 74 deaths and 399 injuries, not including whatever has happened in the last 24 hours. And so I believe that we have to have the mechanisms to achieve the policy parameters I set out at the beginning. I want to say a word about prevent. There have been all kinds of criticisms of prevent. It's been suggested that we should change the name of Prevent. That's one of the silliest suggestions I've ever heard. Do you think if we change the name of Prevent to Engage or something like that, exactly the same rhetoric would not be used against the new name? It's absolutely daft. And actually, Prevent is working extremely well. People say it makes mistakes, but every day of the week, the police, in good faith, arrest people who are innocent. It's part of policing, and part of prevent includes occasionally making mistakes. But I believe that prevent, of course, it needs more money, Ben, a lot more money. <coughs> and I know you're going to give Charles it. On in a minute. Yeah, I know you're going to give it more money anyway. But actually, it works very well, particularly with young people. And the Channel Pro Project, in my view, is an outstanding success. 
And it works at its best, as uh, has been said earlier, when it is community-based and when the police are actually not running it. There isn't a role for the police in prevent unless there's a suspicion of a crime. And then the police have to do what they're paid to do, which is nick people and get them prosecuted if the evidence is there against them. And I just finally, if I may, Dean, want to say a word about the Extremism Commission. I happened to cast a glance yesterday over the um, booklet that's been issued by the recruiters who are trying to recruit the so-called lead commissioner. And I'm afraid the government, Ben, is going to have to sharpen up its act on this. It's far too fluffy. The lead commissioner will only be security vetted up to the lower level, which will mean that the extremism commissioner will not be able to see the same secret material as the independent reviewer of terrorism legislation. That seems to me to be completely daft. And in my view, it's an appointment that's being made at too middle a level. Also, I wish the government had decided before they advertised the post whether the lead commissioner was going to be the only commissioner or one of a number of commissioners. I'm all in favour of the lead commissioner being consulted, as is suggested in that booklet, but it doesn't look as though the government has been very decisive about it. I'm in favour of there being an extremism commission, but I think it should be more robust than is suggested in the booklet I've been talking about. And also, it should be absolutely clear that PREVENT and the Extremism Commission are going, not going to fall over one another. PREVENT is part of counter-terrorism policy. The Extremism Commission is part of counter-extremism policy. And the two are different, and they should be kept different. So overall, I think we have actually been pretty successful um, in our counter-terrorism efforts over the last 17 or 18 years. But obviously there's more to be done, and I welcome the review that uh, Ben was talking about earlier. Thank you, Alex. Sorry. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to briefly focus on the context we now find ourselves in, and also to question the effectiveness of our response and to talk about that thorny issue of nonviolent extremism. Firstly, the, the context, 12 years on from the London bombings, I think it's fair to say that we are losing the battle against extremism. We've had five terrorist attacks in this year alone, six attacks foiled since the Westminster attack, hundreds of convictions for Islamist-related offences, hundreds of those who have left our shores to join ISIS, Al-Qaeda or Al-Shabaab. Um, we've seen thousands of subjects of interest, as, as Ben Wallace mentioned, the rise of extreme right-wing groups and so on. And so I believe that the scale of the problem, especially in relation to Islamist-inspired extremism, has been underestimated. And in that time, what has been the government's response? Well, we've had numerous well-intentioned and tough speeches, including David Cameron's 2011 Munich speech, his Birmingham speech in July 2015, more recently Theresa May's Enough, of, Enough is Enough speech after London Bridge attacks. We've also seen the setting up of the Extremism Task Force, established after the murder of Lee Rigby. We've had iterations of the Prevent Strategy and Contest, and we're now waiting for Contest 3. We've had the announcement of our counter-extremism strategy and bill. We've had the Casey review and so on. <coughs> now, I do not doubt the government's will and good intentions to address this issue. I'm just not convinced that, A, our analysis of the problem, and in particular the scale of the problem, is recognised, and that, B, we have developed an effective pushback against extremists, whether offline, online, for both violent and non-violent extremists, preachers, organisations, social media sites and websites. This lack of a counter-movement is the elephant in the room. And I speak as someone who lives, breathes and sleeps this work, who has spent 10 years running a counter-extremism organisation. And rather than a dwindling Salafi Islamist movement in response to the government's CT and CE efforts, today I see a more confident, brazen and emboldened Salafi Islamist lobby whose reach influence and toxic worldview has, I believe, increased over the years, not decreased. It's why, for example, we are seeing a resurgence of Hizbut Tahrir in some cities. Now, unfortunately, while the security services and the police seek to prevent further attacks, including lone actor attacks, it appears the appeal of ISIS has not declined. Furthermore, non-violent Islamist groups have become 
more mainstream in Muslim communities and even within wider society where charities, interfaith groups, student bodies, anti-racist groups and others legitimize and even partner with these groups. While many focus on the jihadists, I have always believed that if we are serious about seeking to disrupt and undermine the Islamist threat, we need to address those who promote non-violent extremism in our country, who I believe provide the mood music and who normalize the wider Islamist worldview to impressionable youngsters. And what are the, some of the common themes of the British Islamist worldview? Obviously don't have time to talk about all of them now, but take the example of Gamran Hussein, who delivered lectures from his mosques preaching support for ISIS, including to children. He was convicted last week. Now, he claimed the government had created and were funding the EDL to attack Muslims and, unsurprisingly, criticised Prevent. Yet this ideological narrative is shared by so many so-called non-violent British Islamists. A few years ago, I remember Islamists leading a campaign against the CTS Act and the Prevent Duty in particular. And just as one example, Ibti Halbasi, a female barrister, a cage advocate and former media representative of HT, went around nine cities, scaremongering Muslim communities, claiming that, yes, you guessed it, the EDL has been deliberately created by the government to intimidate Muslims, Islam is being criminalised in the UK, and that the authorities were lying about ISIS. This crossover in ideas is not coincidental. There is a shared narrative, and we do not analyse closely enough the propaganda of British Islamists, because if we did we'd be aware of how similar the foundations of this ideology is. And it's precisely why my organisation has endeavoured to draw attention to the arguments of non-violent Islamist preachers and groups operating in the UK. A recent report by the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change highlighted how 77% of British jihadists were associated with non-violent Islamist groups and networks before turning to Salafi jihadism. And other reports have highlighted that many of those convicted for terrorism offences did not solely read Al-Qaeda or ISIS propaganda, but also non-violent extremist propaganda too. And here lies a challenge that remains unchallenged. One of the reasons why I wrote my book was actually to highlight the cooperation and coordination between competing fundamentalist groups who have now created a strong influence and lobby in this country, reaching hundreds of thousands of people through social media, on campuses, and at community events. They then claim to represent the Muslim community, and Muslims like myself or Mac are considered to be sellouts. And from day one, this lobby sought to shift Islamist ideology from the fringe to the mainstream, and I think they've done pretty well, partly because of the lack of resistance. I just wanted to talk about one very quick issue. Um, there is so much in terms of that the Muslim communities themselves can do, but I also want to point a finger to wider society. And one of the most barefaced examples is that of Imam Shaquille Beg, the chief imam at Lewisham Islamic Centre. Almost a year ago, Justice Haddon Cave decried Beg to be an extremist Islamic speaker who espouses extremist Islamic positions and who has encouraged violent jihad. Did that, did that deter Citizens UK from inviting Beg to speak at their events? Did it stop Year 4 children from a local school visiting Lewisham Islamic Centre? Did it stop a local synagogue from inviting him to speak at an interfaith event, despite his violent anti-Semitic views? Did it stop a chief inspector from rubbing shoulders with Beg, or deter ordinary people from attending a Visit My Mosque Day held by Lewisham Islamic Centre? No, it is business as usual for Beg and for our society. And that tells you the kind of problem we have. And so I think I, I will end it there. I've run out of time. Um, at this, I'll end at this happy junction. Happy to take some questions as well. Out of time, but not. <laughs> out of time, but not out of steam. There are going to be a tremendous number of uh, questions to be asked. I'm going to take them uh, in threes, and I'm going to insist they are questions rather than floor speeches. Um, so if I can uh, just take, just trying to get a sense of the room and how many people want to ask questions. Lady there, gentleman at the side, and gentleman there. If, if you, who's got the microphone? Um, I'm surprised that you name an organisation. That's the no question too outrageous. You just have to state who you are. So my name's uh, Leila Dupuis. I have a startup called Kitchen Table, um, but I'm surprised you haven't. I'm a British Muslim, born and bred. I'm surprised you haven't addressed the issue of Trojan <coughs> schools. It seems like we tiptoe around it. Yeah, Trojan cool. schools. How are we allowing them to operate and to still be around? Why you mean are we as not in Trojan Horse in Birmingham, that yeah. sort of syndrome? There's, but that's not the only one. There's a few. 
And I've asked this question before, and it seems that we live on a fear of angering or you know, creating um, hostility between us and the Muslims, and I think that's wrong. I think we need to shut these schools down. Why have we not? Thank you. <laughs> Name an organization, please. Uh, James Bethel from Westbourne Co Communications, but also a campaigner against uh, white extremism. I wondered if um, any on the panel would just like to elaborate a little bit about how they see uh, far-right extremism, white supremacist extremism playing out in the UK. I mean, we, we are very fortunate. The BNP, uh, I'm glad to say, have been led by idiots, and they have faded away. The EDL is, is a rabble, and in many ways, um, we're, we're blessed by poor leadership on, on the uh, extreme right. What's your however, question? What's your however, question? My question is, around the world, extreme right-wing groups are seeming to do very well. And do, do the panel see uh, this becoming a bigger problem or fading away in the UK? The gentleman there, yes. Hi, my name is Thomas Bridge. I'm a Burke councillor in Essex. But as you can probably tell from my accent, I have strong Irish connections. And uh, my question really to the panel is, you both, you've mentioned at the start of the, uh, you go back 25 years, obviously the implicit or the explicit in some cases was Irish terrorism or issues around Northern Ireland. You seem to be saying at this point that that issue has gone away. Do you think there's a risk of it coming back, particularly in the light of potential issues around the border? Very good. Okay, if I can ask, not every panellist has to answer, but Lord Carlyle's whispered in my ear, so if I can give him a chance. I just wanted to deal with the last question because I've spent a lot of time looking at what's happening in Northern Ireland. Yes, it could come back. If we have a Brexit negotiation that creates a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, I think we are potentially asking for a great deal of trouble. But having said that, the policing now and the intelligence are of very high quality. The number of residual terrorists is quite small. We actually know who they are. And though things do occasionally go wrong, and there's a lot of organized crime connected with it, I think we have that under control, provided we aren't Brexited out of the Good Friday Agreement. Ben. Um, well, just on the, I'll go through the three. Um, on the Irish terrorism, no, they haven't gone away. Alex Carlyle's absolutely right. We've got a good lid on them, I think is the word phrase. But, you know, the, 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 the recruiting tactics, they are recruiting, they do aspire, uh, and they are still, the ones still active are definitely potent and dangerous individuals who have successfully killed prison officers and police officers in the last few years. So um, they are definitely there. Um, and, um, yeah, they're not going to go away. Uh, they're, they're there for long term. But at the moment, I think, as Alex says, the quality of the policing, the quality of the intelligence gives us in a space where at the moment we are in a place. I'm not, I wouldn't entirely agree with the Brexit uh, issue. Um, what we noticed when I was the Northern Ireland minister was that they seem... Bizarrely, the dissidents disengage with polit politics. So when Stormont was not happening, or you know, as we have now, an impasse, it didn't seem to respond in their groups. They didn't sort of become more or less active uh, to do that. But um, you know, I, I think no one's taking the eye off the ball. We put in a lot of investment in there, uh, and we'll continue to do so. Um, on the issue of the far right, I, I think it's a more wider issue, and, and, and also speaking slightly to some of the issues that Sarah speaks to, is there is a growing amount of intolerance in a younger generation uh, that seems to be acceptable. You know, I go to colleges and schools where young people, 17, 18, do talk to me in a very intolerant manner about conservative beliefs or other people's beliefs. And, whether, and, and that acceptance of it's okay to call people scum on the outside of a, a conference or it's okay to indulge in, in that type of political activism... Uh, is just part of this theme of a growing bedrock of intolerance that you see played out in universities and in some sixth forms. And it worries me because once you accept intolerance, the recruiters for the far right or uh, Islamists or the Salafist movements sort of you know, have a growing group of people who think it's okay to uh, not uh, you know, be intolerant of other people's views. And I think that is, that is a, a cultural thing uh, where people are self-selecting intolerance online. They're going to sit in their own little space and agree with each other. Uh, and that's something that we need schools to take a lead in, which segments me into the first question, which is absolutely... Uh, it, the Birmingham schools were, uh, in, in the end, uh, you know, 
dealt with. The challenge we face, as in other parts of the world, is the madrasas and the unregulated school space and the homeschooling school space, where we are seeing a growing number of people uh, peddling intolerance in a whole load of areas. And all of that, I'm afraid, in this century, is underpinned by a very powerful uh, uh, platform called the internet that is allowing people to see incredibly, uh, you know, provocative uh, conspiracies and allegations and also training manuals and recruitment. So uh, we have to work in the education space. One of the reasons I talked about the wider counterterrorism family is making sure that the Department of Education is fully engaged in the prevent program and indeed in the actual spotting uh, issues uh, as they come upstream. Sarah, did you have anything to say in response to any of those questions? I think with regards to the Trojan Horse School District, I mean, Ofsted are doing excellent work inspecting mm. schools. I, I think we should you know, give more, them more power to do what they do best, which is to go into these schools um, and, and to decide whether those schools are fit for purpose um, and to support them if, if they're not. So we, I think we should recognise the work of Ofsted, but also be aware that indeed there are examples of, and I, I come across quite a few of them, um, worrying examples of stories similar to the Trojan Horse cases as well. Um, Far-right extremism, yes, a huge concern. We do a lot of work within schools, delivering training to teachers. Um, and teachers really are starting to recognise the problem. More so now, I think, because of the prevent duty. The prevent duty has forced them now to say, we actually do recognise we have pupils in our schools who are spouting anti-Semitism or anti-Muslim hatred. Um, and, and what you're seeing now also is that the kind of original far-right movement has split and it's become more violent, more virulent, and they are, similar to the Islamists, are targeting young people. They are seeking to radicalise young people online and also taking them to events and, and uh, activities in the communities as well, and there's a lot of that that's taking place as well. So it's understanding better what is actually happening on the ground. And then how do we build resilience for young people? And I think some of the work that's, again, being taken place in schools it is phenomenal in terms of the issues around British values, uh, the encouragement of teachers to teach critical thinking skills, to open up discussions and ideas, to challenge uh, perverse views. You know, we come across kids who say that Hitler was a fantastic man. And sometimes those views are actually coming from their own parents and families. And so schools may be the only place where these children are having their views um, targeted and, and challenged. So I think it's really important that we continue to do the great, to, to continue with the work within schools. Um, but there's no doubt about it. I think there's, we're going to see more young children who are being targeted and recruited for far-right extremism, just as, just as we are seeing with children with Islamist extremism. Mac, any thoughts? Yeah, just a small point on <coughs> uh, the Trojan horse question. I thought that, that was an excellent uh, question. Uh, regrettably and unfortunately, I think that a lot of the communities involved are still in a state of denial. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's accepted. I think it's explained away by conspiracy theories as the government against a community, and it's not. Uh, it'd be really interesting to map a change in behavior or outlook or presentation in dress to where we think Trojan horses are occurring, and I bet we could join up the dots to give us a very clear view as to what's going on. And this is my point about understanding the very discreet and subtle natures of beliefs and what's driving them. Because I think extremism has moved away from trying to occupy big institutions or take away, to, uh, take over countries, and is manifesting itself in local spaces governed at that level <coughs> by community leaders. And I think that's where some of our, uh, um, the blockages are. And then when we go close to it, I think we face such an onslaught of rebuttal and an attack that we lose confidence or we just don't want to, it's uncomfortable for us. And going forward, if enough is enough, that's where we need to go. Thank you. Okay, another round of questions. I'm just trying to get a sense because there's so many and some people are going to have to be disappointed. I'm very sorry about that because of the limitation of time. I'm just trying to get a sense. Yes, lady there has been waiting patiently in the middle, just behind you, Ralph. Name an organisation, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, Katie Bourne, I'm a police and crime commissioner. I'm the one representing Sussex. I stand with various colleagues here. Really interesting to hear, very struck with what Max said um, about uh, terrorism can be fought locally in the neighbourhoods. So as police and crime commissioners, we have responsibility for local policing. We have responsibility for budgets. I'm just really interested to hear the panel's views on how, uh, whether they think that police and crime commissioners should be empowered further in this space, because there's a lot we can do, um, as, a, as opposed to having a, a 
an anti-extremism commissioner, another person in the space. We're already here. And what would be the panel's views on, on improving what they've got? Thank you. Gentleman there in the second row. Yes, just... Thank you, Duncan Haynes, Transparency International. It said every transaction leaves a trail. So does understanding terrorist finance uh, principally uh, help you to monitor those suspects and people of concern? Or, or can it even contribute to the disruption the minister speaks of, of uh, terrorist acts in the UK? The gentleman in the middle there as well, just a few rows behind you there, Rob. Thank you. Uh, name name an organisation, please. Andrew Kay from North London. Um, the terrorist in London, uh, in Westminster Bridge, in fact, had a record of criminal behaviour, and indeed it seems like some of the other terrorists this year and last year have um, had a history of being involved in violence. How, um, if you talk about a wider counter-terrorism family, how can probation services and other services make sure that we're actually keeping a track of these um, people who've actually already been on the police's books and have had that history of violent behaviour? How do we prevent them graduating into terrorists? Alex. Well, in relation to that last question, I think probation officers, for example, Sarah referred to school teachers, have a very important role in providing information where they reasonably suspect that people <coughs> may be becoming, um, picking up ideas which are terrorist ideas. And I think one of the great myths around the place is that if you're a probation officer or if you're a teacher, you can't give that information to anyone else because of confidentiality. That's just not what the law is. So I think that teachers and other people who've run into this problem should immediately inform the uh, prevent coordinators in their area. There is a problem, however, with prevent coordinators. There's one in every local government area they're employed by local government. They're therefore subject to some local government financial issues. I met 13 of them in the Midlands a, a few months ago. Most of them were doing something very, very valuable, but one of them from a large conurbation had to admit that he was really only coordinating himself. And that's profoundly unsatisfactory. And I think the way in which prevent coordinators work could be improved by making them more independent a bit like factory inspectors. I think I'll just deal with that question and leave the others to other people. Very good. Ben. Um, okay. Um, probation service, the CT review is all about that. Um, you can only uh, help uh, manage some people that we have concern of if you are aware that we're concerned about them and, and improving that sharing of intelligence that historically may have been held very centrally or in the very sort of uh, pursue space. And, and I think that's what we're looking at. And also... You know, we, we manage dangerous people in the community, you know, uh, uh, paedophiles and, and people like that. And we need to look at some of the lessons of how we deal with that, uh, with those people. Um, terrorist finance, I think there's two parts to that. One is what we know at the moment with the, the guys doing sort of, uh, you know, grabbing a van and a, and a knife, small sums of money. But we learn a lot post-incident from what the banks are, are allow us to look at and will share with us about you know, piecing that together, and that's really, really important. Uh, the other half of terrorist financing is, I suppose, really in Sarah Khan's area, which is the issue of, we have to ask ourselves, not necessarily how, many people, how people are enabled to do a terrorist act with finance, but how can we have so many people uh, convinced that extremism, whether it's non-violent or violent, is a place that's okay or is taught to them, and who is funding that, and how is that being funded? Uh, and I want to uh, do more in the government space to cramp down that on that. On prevent, local leadership is absolutely important. I'm, you know, I'm a Lancashire MP where some of my neighbours were not put off. So Jack Straw is, is a neighbour and represents a, a multi-ethnic community with all sorts of tensions when he was the MP in Blackburn. Anne Cry was another uh, MP not very far away. They, neither of them said, oh, we're not Muslim, we can't go into Muslim communities and talk to them about what's successful. They did some really, really good local leadership and one of the reasons some of those areas they used to represent is, n is not of concern as some other communities is actually because of the role of local leaders. Local police forces thinking very hard about who they are appointing as superintendents to make sure they understand communities. And at the same time, local councils, where local councils, no matter what colour the councils are, you know, Conservative, Labour or Liberal Democrat, where they take leadership and actually engage in the prevent programme, we see some really good uh, results. And where they don't, either where they play to the gallery 
Uh, and uh, you know there are lots of there is there is a few I mean far too many politicians who like to play to the gallery and not have the tough conversations. That's where we have problem. And PCCs are part of that very strong local leadership. And it's not just about policing; it's the broader space. So they absolutely have a role in it. Uh, and hopefully, in this CT review, when we're looking at prevent, that is where we need to go. Matt, just Katie, good morning. Just on on your question, I think PCCs have a real role. I think you could use your elected mandate in a far more powerful way. I'd like it to feature more explicitly in the police and crime plan and then hold those people who are going to deliver it, including the police, far more to account than, than what is at the moment. You've done a great job with, I think, vulnerability. I think this is the same sort of tenants. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer your question as well. I, I definitely think you're right. I think they can be empowered a lot more. I think three key areas I think that they could do more on is Understanding or mapping out local groups, extreme groups that they should be concerned about, events that are happening, who are they reaching out to? Because I, I, through the work that I do, I see that all the time, but I, I wonder if local authorities understand who the key players are in their cities, and I don't think they do, because then they'd understand what events are happening, who's going to those events, how many people are going to, how many people are being influenced, and so forth. So I think that mapping out exercise is really important on a local level. Um, the second is to actually work with local partners who want to challenge those organisations and groups, because often they feel very alone, they don't feel they have the support of local authorities. I've seen examples actually where uh, local authorities have sided with wrong groups actually, who are promoting intolerance. So I, th I think that's really important that to work with local partners who want to challenge these uh, organisations and, and ideologues, so to speak. Um, and then finally, I think it's really important that the police and, and the crime commissioners and others within the police, local police forces don't actually partner themselves with you know, extremist preachers, and I've seen many examples of that, because all that does is legitimise those voices, and it's incredibly dangerous. It really just, you know, sometimes I wonder, why do I bother getting up every morning and doing what I'm doing? If I'm saying a preacher X is horrendous, but then I see charities or police commissioners or others having, sharing a platform with them and legitimising them. So I think, you know, for me, those three things are really critical. Thank you. We're just going to have two more questions, I'm afraid. Sorry to disappoint anybody. There's a lady there, stand near you, Ralph. Yes, just there. Name an organisation, please. Yes, uh, if, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Anne Marine Raza. I'm um, chair of a, a charity that educates uh, women in, in, in England who don't speak the language. Um, I also mentor first offenders. So the question, I think, is to Mac or anyone on the panel um, how are we tackling or addressing the issue of Muslim first offenders who are being recruited? and are out or come back and are as hard as ever with regards to their Islamist views. Gentlemen there, last question. Yes, you've been waiting patiently. Yeah, thank you. Name an organization, please. Martin Parsons. I've written on counter-extremism on conservative homes since 2008. Um, question specifically to Ben. Can we tighten up the definition of extremism, please? Um, we're doing vastly better than the last Labour government. We've linked it to historic British values, but we're still only talking about things like democracy and one law for all. All Islamists actually believe in one law for all. It just happens to be Sharia. <laughs> um, half of them believe in democracy. Can we include things like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press that... Um, have evolved in this country over the centuries, then we might have a counter-narrative. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry to disappoint anyone. Ben. Uh, just very briefly, I mean, one of the British values that are taught by the Prevent Schools uh, uh, individuals is equality. And, you know, if, if you want to know what I think is at the heart of the extremism is that when people decide, and you see it a lot in the Salafist narrative, and you see it in the neo-Nazi, in this concept of purity, and if you are pure, it, it, they imply that everyone else is a lesser person. That is the pathway that leads ultimately to these people justifying themselves that violence is okay because you're actually not really doing it against your equal. You're doing it against someone who is lesser or whatever. And you see that played out in the narrative time and time again. And if you, you know, I have to read part of my job is, you know, I read the Inspire magazine. It's an interesting name published by uh, Al Qaeda or Remaya is the. ISIS online magazine, and it is full of actually theology. In between the just terror tactics section, uh, or how to kill lots of people, is this bizarre theological sort of vomit that comes out every year, uh, every month, which is about 
that sort of how to justify that you are somehow purer and therefore someone is less equal and therefore dehumanized. And it, that is, to me, the path where it needs to be challenged in the narrative in Islam. It absolutely has to be. Also has to be challenged in the narrative in neo-Nazis, which is why you see the latest neo-Nazi groups much more getting involved in anti-Semitism, you know, the sort of purer, the purer you know, society of Britain and all that garbage that they come out with. So those two areas, equality is a central tenant, and we have to keep teaching it, because otherwise the Puritans effectively, and I'm a Langstrom MP, I know all about Puritans from the 17th century, they get the grips, and that's the pathway. Matt, final word. Yeah, ju just on um, bespoke services for Muslim uh, young offenders, apart from uh, the role of prison imams, which, which I think there's a big question mark over in any case because of their... Uh, their own school of thought may not be the right school of thought that I think is, is healthy, and the prevent program or co or contest, sorry, or channel. I'm not so sure there's any other bespoke services that that reach out at the moment. Well, there's a huge Muslim population within prisons, uh, which needs to have uh, some response and some some services that, that that cater for that. But I just think that's missing at the moment. Um, I don't want to be out Lancashire by Ben. I was brought up in Burnley and were most certainly not Puritans in Burnley, <laughs> though we have a very tight defence these days. Um, on the subject of extremism being defined, be careful what you wish for. As a dry lawyer's answer, I would say to you that the nature, the way in which we've made Acts of Parliament since 1215, and I don't mean 1215 p.m., um, has meant that they are very narrowly defined and many things that might be extremism now might not be if we tried to define it too tightly. On returners, I certainly am of the view that we need to give more resources to the way in which we scrutinise returners. Don't get the idea that we're going to put electronic bans on any of them uh, because that's just not going to happen. That's just wishful thinking by a few people, but we can scrutinise what they do more. On Muslim first offenders, it depends on who you're talking about. If we're talking about young Muslim first offenders, then I would commend to you the work being done by the Youth Justice Board, chaired now by Charlie Taylor, who um, Michael Gove brought into the Department of Education when he was Secretary of State there, and has built up a huge amount of expertise, including in this area. Um, and uh, the one other point I wanted to make is that Muslim women, especially those who do not speak the English language yet fully, are of extreme importance. Muslim women are the instrument that has the formidable power to prevent the men in their families from becoming terrorists. And we have to give as much resource as we possibly can to developing the awareness of Muslim women, even if they don't want to be um, great um, orators and spokespeople like Sarah for their community. I'm sure you would agree the importance of Muslim women in families and in communities in places like Burnley, where I come from, um, who have an immense amount to contribute. Thank you. Sarah. I completely agree with everything Lord Carlyle has said. Um, just a little bit about the extremism definition. Again, I think it's very difficult to have a legal definition for extremism precisely for the reasons that Lord Carlyle has, has mentioned. I've thought very long and hard about what I would define as extremism as a, as a kind of a working base um, perspective, really. And, and uh, my, what I've come up with is, <laughs> very simply, and which I've written about in my book, is that anyone who incites violence, hatred or discrimination for ideological, political or religious reasons mm -hmm. could possibly be defined as extremism. Um, and also when we talk about it, it being in opposition to fundamental human rights, I mean, we talked about British values, and I, again, I agree with what, what, what Ben Wallace said there, but for me, I think more than that, actually, if you look at what all extremists have in common at the core, all of them are opposed to someone's fundamental human rights. And so there's a clear correlation between extremism and, and human rights. And so, again, I'm not in favour of having a legal definition of extremism, but I think you can have a, a working definition mm. per se. Thank you. just want to, uh, as I say, winding up, reiterate my appreciation, Julian Inotzi, Paul Ree, for their sponsorship yeah, to an absolutely yeah. brilliant panel. You've been a fantastic audience. And just also to urge you to take away this very important work that the series has produced. Spectacular. <laughs>
go out with a bang. <laughs> Forward by David Petraeus. It's a, it's a brilliant piece of work. It's been uh, taken up now, being consi recommendations considered by the Home Office. And uh, as I say, it's uh, not going to be our last intervention in this space in the coming months. So please join me in thanking our panelists. and. Uh,